This is how most people learn to TIG weld outside corners. But this may be stupid, and I'm gonna show you why, before you waste hours of practice time and all of your materials. Welcome to my welding shop here today. I'm gonna teach you how to weld an outside corner. So first we're gonna go over what we want things to look like. These are our goals. This is a pretty joint. Everybody loves throwing these down. Everybody wants to do these really well. When done well, these can look really cool with their consistency. They're usually always around the outside or perimeter of a project, so they're pretty show off, which is nice. For over the two decades of welding experience that I have and I'm still building and still learning from, doing the outside corner joint was one of my favorite things to do just because it looks so dang good. It's a real flex if you can do these well. When done well, we want the profile of this to be completely smooth over the outside corner of a joint, obviously. Typically what can happen with this is people misjudge the amount of filler material that they might be needing or using, and it's pretty easy to overfill this one. You'll get these little overfill edges like this here. Obviously that's going to ruin your consistency, especially if it gets painted after the fact. It's also possible to underfill these. That causes them to overheat really badly. We obviously want to avoid that as well. This example that we're looking at here right now is pretty much exactly what you want. We can see that the overall size of the welding bead, which is dictated usually by the amount of heat that's building up in the workpiece, this is controlled really well and matched with a proper amount of filler material, which gives it this profile that looks nice and smooth over the edges, yet still filled up enough. The next thing that's really going to set this off is really consistent and robotic stepping consistency. Stepping consistency comes from a term that I call stepping distance. This is the distance from each puddle as you step along the length of a welding pass. You can see that things can look really robotic and awesome, especially with this outside corner joint. In a lot of cases, you're also going to want to flip the joint over and see some good penetration to the inside like this. You can see that the amount of heat has been focused into the joint combined with a proper amount of filler material you're you're gonna get some penetration through to the other side, which is exactly what you want for maintaining strength as well as the overall performance of the weld long-term. Okay, first thing we're gonna go over here is material preparation. This is extremely important. This is a really basic 5,000 series of aluminum practice plate here. You can see the dimensions on screen, nothing crazy. Mostly you just wanna make sure that you properly clean the edges. You can see what I'm doing here right now. I start off by decontaminating with acetone. This is a great way that you can just get rid of any crap that comes on it. They are never clean even if you buy them brand new. The next thing I'm going to do is wire brush my edges. You can see I'm actually using one of the plates as a little ruler and I'm going to use this just to keep my wire brushing looking really organized and consistent. I'm going to do both sides of the plate like this and then I'm going to use that one as a ruler for the other one. I repeat the process and you can see how clean these look as far as the wire brushing preparation. One thing that drives me crazy is when I see people just grab a wire brush and just scratch and scribble away. There's nothing worse than seeing like a really nice welding bead with a bunch of crazy shitty looking scratching underneath. I know it's a long way to go this extra mile to get this kind of result with your wire brushing, but believe me, it pays off in the end. For example, if you take a look at one of these other projects that I've done here, this was a crazy sculpture project that I actually used as a welding lesson. We went over a bunch of details on how to control your heat with more intricate shapes, and you can see the wire brushing was all done this way. It looks absolutely spotless as far as the organization. And like I said, it does take a little bit of extra time to prepare them like this, but if you want to go the extra mile, it pays off. Okay, the next thing that we want to do here is decontaminate and clean your filler material. Everybody forgets this part. Even brand new filler materials, you'll wipe them off. Look at this crap here. This is gross. Again, just do a few sticks at a time, clean them off, get them decontaminated, and then you got them right on your table, ready to rock. I prefer using 1 8th or 3.2 millimeter filler material for almost everything I do. There's the odd job here and there where I might go down to 3 32nd of an inch or 2.4 millimeters. Now for settings and gas, this is something that obviously is a little bit subjective to everybody machine, but you can see what I'm getting set up with here. This is the Everlast Typhoon 230. This machine is sick. I've used this machine for almost two years now, and I've honestly not even batted an eye at making any changes to my setup. I love it. You can see on screen the settings that I ended up using here. Again, depending on your setting, you may make some changes with your balance and frequency, but the overall ballpark of this is going to get you started. You can see the gas that I'm using is also good for the setup that I'm using in my torch. So let's take a look at the torch here right now. Again, this torch is nothing crazy. You can see this torch here is a water-cooled torch. Whatever you got though, honestly, it doesn't have to be water-cooled. Don't go spend a bunch of money on something you might not end up needing. I have air-cooled or gas-cooled torches that I've used in here for years, even before I got my water cooling set up. It works fine. The big thing that you want to remember with your torch is that it is assembled correctly. I am using a gas lens setup. This is just what I prefer on the inside. I make sure that it is done up correctly. The adapter is correct for my torch. And you can see I'm using a number five cup, nothing crazy. 
I put a clean tungsten in and that's it, we're ready to rock. Okay, to get welding here, we're gonna go over something first. And I know everybody's looking forward to jumping into it, which is everybody's problem. Ready for this? When people wanna learn the outside corner joint, you know what they try and do? They try the outside corner joint. Now, this is where I'm gonna stop everybody in your tracks. Inside my textbook here, this goes through a curriculum that you follow. Basically takes you from the ground up, understanding your machine, basic passes, all the way up to more advanced stuff like outside corners, fillet joints, and stuff like that. Now, one thing that my book does is it teaches you a lot of fundamentals first before you move on to more advanced stuff. So opening my book here, taking a look at the outside corner chapter, look at all the stuff that comes before it. This is all stuff that people need to learn before you start attempting the outside corner joint. Don't get me wrong, when I first started to learn, I just sent it and just tried things a bunch of times and tried to get things that kind of worked out all right. But I have saved people literally months of practice and piles of uh, practice material from learning things in the order or the blueprint that I show in this textbook. I don't mean to shamelessly self-promote this book, but I'm gonna. This book is available on my website. I just re-upped with another shipment. It sold out once before really quickly. It's gonna sell out again, so get one before they're gone. I might have a little Black Friday sale coming up, just a hint. So what I recommend in my book, as well as to my students that I teach personally, is that before we get going with an outside corner joint, we really want to get dialed with our flat stuff. That's right. A lot of people People are excited to jump into the more flashy outside corner work, but if your flat stuff, like a stringer bead or something like that, is not dialed, don't even bother. What's gonna happen is that you need to know what to look for, and that's gonna translate over much easier to something like the outside corner joint. Take a look at these stringer passes here, watch this. What I'm doing here is basically, obviously, laying down just a stringer bead, which is just a blank pass on a flat piece of plate, nothing crazy. But what I'm doing is looking for some very important details. In my actual, like, TIG welding career, curriculums on my website. One of the biggest parts to every project or new joint that we do is a warm up exercise. And this is what this is. We wanna make sure we're properly warmed up with our flat passes. And we wanna look for the details of completely blended and fused edges with a good amount of reinforcement with good stepping consistency. We wanna make sure that the details of the welding is nice and shiny. That means that our settings are really bang on for the material that we're using. We wanna make sure the cleaning action looks good. This is a very important detail, even for myself. Somebody who's been professionally TIG welding for over 20 years, I always fire up and just warm up with a couple stringer passes literally before anything I do. If I'm happy with the results that I'm seeing on the flat stuff, then I'm comfortable enough to get going on more advanced and intricate stuff. One thing that's very important is when you start to tack this joint together. You wanna make sure that this is tacked together with no gap from start to finish, and you wanna make sure that the plates are aligned. You don't want anything crooked, and you don't want any excessive overlap on one side as opposed to the other. And obviously gap is not a good thing. Make sure you fit it up correctly and tack it together well. Now, here's another really key thing that I teach all of my students. And again, this is in the book here. This is just a little preview of what you're watching right now. We're gonna learn this joint in two different steps. What you're looking at here is typically how most people try and learn this joint, which is where you're gonna see the two plates fixed in some kind of a 90 degree position. Now, the one thing that you wanna do, and we've talked about this with warm ups, is we wanna make things easy. We do not want any difficulty with trying out something new. Like I say to all my students and in my book here, when you move on to a new exercise, it should be different, not difficult. With a proper warm up, like we talked about earlier and making it a little easier for ourselves, we've now given ourselves two really powerful things that are gonna help you learn this faster. You can see I am positioning this thing on the table in a 45 degree angle so that you're basically welding along the peak of a house. This is gonna make the gravity equal pulling on either side. You're not gonna have a high side and a low side like you would if you were learning it in a fixture like this. And you will notice when you set up to weld this in a 45 degree position on your table, you're gonna have the exact same sight lines for the most part, as well as body comfort that you would if you were doing a flat pass on a stringer bead. That's why I always encourage people to warm up with stringer beads because it's exactly the same as trying to weld the outside corner joint on a 45 degree angle. When you start running this in the 45 degree position, you're gonna be able to see everything really clearly. And like I talked about, because gravity's pulling on either side at the exact same, you're not gonna worry about having any mismanagement of your filler material rolling over one side or the other. As long as you are paying attention to your edges on one side, chances are it should be good on the other side as well. You can see the amount of heat that I'm using here. It's nothing crazy at all. The amount of filler material that I'm using is extremely important to manage. If you keep the amount of filler material 
material healthy in relation to the amount of heat that you are using, this is going to stay in control much easier. Now, when we finish, the idea is that you learn and inspect your work with the 45 degree version first. Again, like we talked about with our goals, we wanna see each edge completely blended in, nice and smooth, nice and consistent on either side. We want the filler material to be settled in the center. We don't wanna see it hanging over to one side or the other. We want everything to be balanced and symmetrical right down the middle. If you're using something like a 3.2 millimeter or 1 8 uh, base material, you will be able to flip it over and take a look at your heat input and see how you did for some penetration on the other side. But honestly, if you are using something like a 3 16th or 4.6 millimeter uh, base material, it's gonna be really challenging to punch through to the other side. So honestly, the way I teach my students and I go over it in my book here, is I make sure that everybody is perfect on the top side first. If somebody's complaining about lack of penetration, but their top side doesn't look that good yet, why bother worry about two sides at once instead of just focusing on the one side you can see. Focus on getting everything perfect on the top side first, and then once you're pro at that, then you can start working on getting some punch through on some penetration on the other side as well. Now, what we wanna do at this point is if everything's looking good with the 45 degree lesson, then you can go ahead and fix it on some kind of a fence or whatever on your table and learn it in the 90 degree position. This is gonna be more challenging because like we talked about with uh, the goals that we wanna see with our outside corner joints, we wanna see the filler material settled in the center. And obviously when we're doing it with a 90 degree joint like this, we have a high side and we have a low side and the low side obviously is more affected by gravity. Meaning that as you feed the filler material in, it's gonna settle much lower. And this causes you to do some compensation with your torch angle. As we get everything dialed in with the amount of stepping and travel speed that we are using, you're really monitoring and keeping a close eye on your edges and the amount of filler material that you are using. As long as you're paying attention and you put some work in with your warm ups as well as the 45 degree version first, you're gonna start to see that your chances of getting a good 90 degree version become much better. When you finish the two versions, you honestly shouldn't be able to tell which one was done in a 90 degree position and which one was done in a 45 degree position. This is what's gonna really challenge you to build your consistency between these two joints. You want them to look almost identical for the most part. And again, learning them in both positions is gonna really build your overall experience with learning how to TIG weld. And this is something that I go over in my book a lot. One really important thing that we wanna look for is good stop starts if you do a stop start in the middle. Obviously, we wanna continue the consistency from the first half to the second half. And this is what's gonna make this joint much more easy and enjoyable to learn. Go pick up one of these textbooks before they sell out again. I design these graphics and everything completely by myself, no help. These are printed here in Canada where I live and my wife and I literally ship them out from my shop here in my garage at my house. This is as DIY, there is no drop shipping, no Amazon deal or anything like that. I take a lot of pride in doing this all for you guys. Be sure to pick up one of the books before they sell out and make sure today you do a random act of kindness for a stranger. I mean it, you guys. Make the world a better place today if you can. My name is Dusty James, Phil and Chill. We'll talk soon, peace.